Good morning. Hope everyone is well. Uh, welcome to Derry City, uh, legendary London Derry. Um, delighted for you all to be with us today. Um, Level Up 2021 is a two day blended event focused on ideas, innovation, and inspiration for a post pandemic future. It's been pretty tough for the last 12 months, um, and I'm delighted that we're in Echo Echo, which is a dance studio based in the city. Um, that industry has been on hold for 12 months. So I can't think of a better place to be than somewhere hopefully that's gonna kickstart and start dancing again in the next few months. Um, we'll be exploring how both people, both locally and internationally, can have the opportunity to shape an economic future, provide growth, provide real change, and some of those people have been doing it over the last 12 months. So this is an event in partnership with Starticus, which is ourselves, Derry City and Strabane Council. Thank you to sponsors, including Allstate and I, Regional College, Northwest Regional College, UU, Raise, Real Time, and Esri Island. Um, Fran, I'd like to think we're like the Ant and Deck of <laughs> Northern Ireland. I'm not sure that's the case. Maybe the Richard and Judy, but um, Fran, do you want to maybe just start? She's smiling, but she's not saying anything. Um, maybe you can just start by explaining the six key themes that we're going to be talking about today. Sure. Well, over the next few days, sorry. Yeah, well, we have a real range of things, really interesting topics, especially considering the last 12 months. Uh, so we're going to start with smart places and rural innovation, the future of retail and the high street, to be followed by entrepreneurship and innovation, which, of course, we all love, health and wellness, social change and inclusion and diversity. So we have a really interesting range of topics here, Alistair, and I'm yeah. so excited to hear what the panelists have to say about it. No, them. thank you, Fran, and thank you for joining us as well. Um, what I would like to say as well is obviously what we're going to be looking to do is try and drive some conversation around what opportunities exist. It's not looking back. It's not looking at the pandemic in, a, in what has been a very difficult 12 months. So it's looking at kind of things that hopefully can shape both locally here in Derry City, across the Northwest and Northern Ireland, across Ireland, across the world. Um, and we're going to be chatting some real good folk, obviously, over the next two days that are doing that now. Yeah, and we're going to be shaping this in sessions. So in the first level up session, we're going to examine what a smart city and an urban area actually is and what that will mean for the future of urban spaces and rural communities alike. Yeah, perfect. And obviously, we give a shout out here to Esri Island, who's the sponsor of this section. Uh, thank you, team. Always great to have you involved. We'll be chatting, obviously, with the team from Esri a wee bit later on. Uh, we've got Ben Scott Robinson, co-founder of Small Robot Company. Let's just say it's small robots instead of big tractors. I think that interests me straight away. We've got Philip McLaughlin, client manager of Edgery Island. And then who's on the panel? So we have a great lineup on the panel today. We'll be hearing from Irene McAleese, who's the co-founder of Seasense. Stephen McPeak, founder of Civic Dollars. Severio Romeo, lead expert for Dairy London Dairy in the EU Intelligent Cities Challenge Project. We'll be speaking to Emma Marshall, who's the Accelerator Programme Lead at Connected Places Catapult, Michal McLaughlin, CSO and co-founder of CropSafe, and Terry Canning, co-founder of Catalye. Perfect, Fran. And obviously, just to give you the heads up, each two-hour session, um, it follows a similar format. So we've got keynote speakers, we've got panellists. You'll also have the opportunity to hear from early stage Northern Irish startups who are looking to change the world. Um, and we've managed to, to obviously get a good selection from across Northern Ireland as well. So uh, a few from Derry, a few from all over the place. So it's really exciting. Um, again, thank you to Esri Island. And now I just want to pass you over to the mayor, who's going to say a few words before we kick on. Good morning, everyone. I would like to extend a very, very warm welcome to all of you. And thank you for joining our Leveled Up event as part of Enterprise Week 2021. This is actually the ninth year of Enterprise Week, and I'm delighted to say that it's growing from strength to strength. This has been a very, very challenging year for all of us right across the Terry City and Stavant District Council area, living in, under restrictions that none of us uh, are used to. But it's been particularly challenging for all of our local entrepreneurs and businesses who have had to shut down their businesses and come up with new ideas and innovative ways to try and adapt their business uh, to make it viable um, and try and tr pull it through uh, the lockdown scenario. Throughout Enterprise Week, we will be trying our best to, to show and offer you support and offer all of our local entrepreneurs support and getting their business ready to live in a post-COVID uh, society. Throughout the, the next number of days, uh, we have a number of very, very strong speakers who have all um, come through and all 
pull businesses through very, very challenging and difficult times. And I think you'll agree that the caliber of speakers that we have is top class. And I hope, sincerely hope that you're able to learn uh, from their experiences. Over the last number of months, particularly the last 12 months, we've had some very, very strong uh, funding packages delivered right under the heart of this city and district. The signing of the heads of terms of the Dairy and Stavane City Deal is something that we have never, ever experienced before. £250 million pound delivered straight into the, the, the Dairy and Stavane era, which I have no doubt will help stimulate our economy and offer all of our people, young and old, uh, new opportunities and new, uh, create new jobs for, for people right across this council area. But not only that, I also believe that it will be people outside of this council area who will benefit from it. People in the Causeway Coast and Glens and Donegal County Council and the Fermanagh and Oma districts will all benefit from this £250 million. I, I hope that you have a very, very enjoyable time and that you are able to pick up some learning uh, and support from council and from other businesses and other local entrepreneurs across the Derry and Stavane area. And once again, on behalf of Derry City and Stavane District Council, I thank you for your participation and I thank you for taking the time out to, to join with us and, and, and support our teams while they try to support you. Thank you. Now we'd like to introduce you to the story of three small robots, Tom, Dick and Harry. And of course, their co-founder, Ben Scott Robinson of Small Robot Company. Thank you for inviting me to talk today, Alistair. Hello everyone, my name is Ben Scott Robinson and I'd like to talk to you about the future of farming and the small robot company. Now, the first generation of agricultural robotics is driven by a need to simply automate existing processes. And while there are significant financial gains to be made from reducing labor in high value crops, it doesn't answer the existential problems facing the farming of the world's staple crops. The problems that we're starting to see now and in the next 10 years will be the difference between sustainable food for all and environmental collapse. Small Robot Company is delivering the next generation, a transformative breakthrough we think, think that we call her palm farm. Now, this radical approach uses lightweight autonomous vehicles to provide a near real time view of each crop plant as it grows in the field through the season. And then using this view to deliver precise and timely interventions to make that plant achieve its full potential. And by doing this, we can strip out all the inefficiencies and the vast overuse of herbicides and pesticides, fungicides and fertilizer. And because we don't disturb or compact the soil, we allow the ecosystem of a field to do what it does best, which is fix itself. This is not an evolution. To do per plant farming, you need to design a complete service from the ground up, but the results will make the tractor as redundant now as tractors made the horse. Now, in a stable market, this increase in yields and decrease in inputs makes financial sense, but farmland is degrading worldwide. Weather patterns are unstable. Yields are being wiped out by floods or droughts or fire. And the subsidy and insurance model that governments deploy worldwide is changing to support a more sustainable carbon positive farming model. Now, when you combine these additional revenues and counter these additional threats, over the next 10 years, our service will be able to increase the value of every hectare by 10 times over the existing system. Now, this immediately addressable market is made up of farmers that we already know, but more about that later. Now, we'd love to say that this is our idea, but the reality is that we only came to this through listening to cereal farmers. From the very start, we have been directly plugged in to their fears and ambitions. We started the robot company after six months of detailed qualitative research. The very concept came directly from them, which is why Small Robot Company so accurately answers their needs and why our customers include the most influential arable farmers in the UK, the UK's largest landowner, and a major supermarket chain. And these fears that the farmers have are well placed. The industrial processes and giant saw crossing machines 
of the third agricultural revolution have exerted a massive toll on billions of hectares of land worldwide. The loss of topsoil, the damage caused by compaction, the proliferation of resistant weeds, all these are forcing farmers to spend more and more simply producing the same yields that they did in 2000. So this isn't an individual process that needs automating. It has to be a new model of farming and with it a new way of providing what farmers need, a service that looks after the crop throughout its life and a suite of robots to deliver it. So it's with great pleasure that I've introduced Tom, Dick, Harry and Wilma. Tom lives on the farm, continuously gathering data on the plants and the environment. Wilma is the brains of the operation, converting Tom's data into instructions for Dick and Harry. Dick and Harry are delivered on farm when they're needed. Dick nurtures and protects the crop. He kills weeds individually using electricity and sprays only the plants that need it. Harry precisely plants the crops at exactly the right depth and spacing for the condition, giving it the best chance of the highest yields. And farmers don't buy these robots. They pay per hectare per year for the service. They pay for the delivery of a healthy crop. Now, we know all too well that to deliver one robot that works reliably in all conditions is tough, but three is a huge undertaking. So we have created a modular architecture across all our robots that allows the reuse of standardized components to build the service. Thanks to our completely unique per plant view, we have developed our robots to deliver to the realities of the field. Weeds and pests and disease aren't uniformly spread. So we've designed a weeding service that is not tied to tediously following rows, but can delicately traverse the field to the areas where they're needed. Now, our pride and joy is Tom, a third generation robot designed to our final service requirements. He is incredibly light and designed to cover a rough field while acting as a stable data collection platform. He exerts a third of the ground pressure of your foot and a tenth of a traditional tractor. Tom is also designed to fit on a standard Euro pallet or into the back of a small van. In fact, you can get two Toms into the back of a transit van. He's designed to be fully autonomous. He's designed to be part of farming as a service. Now, none of this would be possible without Wilma. Unlike other robotics companies who use per robot machine vision to myopically act on only what they see in front of them, Wilma sits above the robot and is designed to ingest terabytes of raw data, processing it on the edge and providing a live view of the fields down to each weed, each crop plant and the surrounding environment. Wilma also understands the needs of the plants and provides mission control, including routing and payload for the robots. Now, Wilma is an astonishingly robust system. Uh, developed on Java Spring and using a containerized platform, she has automated data flows, cutting edge neural network algorithms, elastic search. I won't bore you with all the buzzwords, but you get what I mean. Now, delivering this whole service at once would be impossible. So we are initially focused on showing the power of per plant farming through answering the most pressing existential threat for farmers today. And that is controlling an increasingly resistant population of weeds with an ever shrinking arsenal of chemicals. We know this because they've told us time and time again. So our first service is very tightly focused. We will be providing a system developed by Rootwave that controls these weeds using a targeted electric weeding system that literally blasts an individual plant with a mini bolt of lightning. By using this system, we can offer rolling weed control at emergence, so stopping any threat to the crop. And we're providing it to the audience that needs it most. Farmers that are either organic or using soil protecting zero till planting systems. Organic farmers need a way to control the weeds that doesn't need tilling, a carbon releasing practice that damages soil compaction. And zero till farmers need a way to reduce their reliance on glyphosate and counter their overwhelming weed problem caused by leaving the soil undisturbed. Now we have all these customers on board already, but this is only part of the story. By understanding each plant in the field, we are able to bring a level of subtlety and efficaciousness that is unheard of 
On one side, we know that only 40% of the weeds in the field need to be completely eradicated. 20% are sort of neutral and can just be thinned out, and 40% are actually beneficial to the crop plants. And of the bad weeds, we're unique in being able to target the very worst, black grass. This grass weed is so pernicious it is taking entire fields out of production. It is approaching 70% resistance to all herbicides, and it is also visually indistinguishable from wheat until it is ready to seed, and then the damage is done. Through our forensic view of the crop and using specific light spectra, we have a unique method for being able to detect black grass as it emerges so that Dick can then kill it. The last three and a half years have been frenetic to us. So we've progressed from a standing start to having a tom that's close to production readiness and a data platform that gives us a detailed view of the crop and broadleaf weeds and a robotic test platform for testing electric weeding in fin. In 2019, we started using tom in anger on customer farms and we've been conducting paid for trials mapping emerging wheat and weeds for two seasons. This growing year, we have a customer facing service for three lucky farmers growing winter wheat, and we've been able to provide them a view of their emerging crop and those weeds. We've also developed a minimal draft force precision planting system from 15 candidate designs that works effectively in the lab. More importantly, we've been able to demonstrate the end to end process of collecting, mapping and killing weeds. But this year is really where it gets interesting. Utilising our modular platform, we're engineering our new Dick robot and evolving AIs ready to on-farm weeding trials next season. We lost our AI partner in uh, November 2020 when Cosmonio was bought by Intel. So we've built an AI team from people previously at DeepMind. Over the next three years, we are including crop care in the form of per-plant disease detection and treatment and the targeting of sludge, slugs for biological spraying. We are also working with a large seed company to build data models of up to eight crops that provide co full coverage across the arable rotation. This means that robots can grow every crop in the arable rotation, and we can remove the tractor completely from the farm. This is our key target. Once the tractor is reduced to just carrying the family to the harvest festival, we are embedded. In 2022, we're accelerating the planting robot mechanism, and alongside the building of products is the expansion of the service. This includes the autonomy, which has moved from line following to linking the data in Wilma to instructions ready for the robots. Now, essentially, we're not yet in market, but we have created a fanatical group of farmers. To keep them engaged, we have created three streams of engagement. Firstly, the 100 Club, a group of farmers who have signed expressions of interest to use our service when it's ready. Next, we've created a training and networking program for forward-thinking farmers to look at how a business of farming will evolve in the world of the fourth agricultural revolution. We call this Farm Ambition. Finally, we have a group of farmers who have prepaid for our service and who act as our consultants. These are our farmer advisory group and they are our first paid customers. Now, we see our path to growth being split across three phases. Between now and 23, we'll be developing and trialling our service to get it robust. We're working with farmers we know well and accept that the cost and pace and reliability is not yet to commercial standards. However, we can still charge for our service. This is the benefit of providing farming as a service. From 23 to 26, we'll be rolling out our service to our fans. This is a time of exciting growth and learning the lessons of delivering the service to a diverse geography. From the farms we own, we expand the hectoridge and the crops we cover, and we also get to serve all the farmers that have signed up. We'll be delivering um, and developing and implementing our service hubs and to start to deliver service in secondary territories, such as Canada. After 26, things get really fun. Having proven the point, we can scale as fast as our customers and manufacturing will allow. These three phases roll out across cost and revenue as well. 21 to 23 are expensive. We're pouring money in to get the service right while charging a minimal amount for the first parts of our service to the customers. Each hectare served is an expense, but a valuable learning opportunity. And as the final parts of our service come online in 23 or 24, we can start to see how we can achieve parity. We've also been approached by some of the biggest names in chemical and seed to provide Tom and Wilma for their product trials. Thanks to a recent hire of a VP of sales from IBM, we're converting these into six-figure multi-year contracts. These are not yet in our rent revenue forecasts, but we're in advanced stages of commercial negotiation. 23 to 26 sees our progression to profit. 
The proof points around unit costs align one by one, with the key metric being around the cost of manufacture and the delivery of the service infrastructure. We will also be learning valuable lessons on international revenues as we roll out into very different marketplaces with very different revenue and cost bases. After 26, we will expand to cover vastly different markets with new opportunities of scale, as well as learning lessons in how to serve the small farmers and the small fields of sub-Saharan Africa and India. This is our chance to have a truly global impact. Now, getting the team right to deliver this is vital. We are arguably trying to solve as many problems as self-driving cars, and so we need the skills to make it work. This can't be done by five people in a shed. It can't really be done by a team of ex-students who have no experience of delivering a commercial service, and it can't be done by a bunch of academics with no view of commercial imperatives. Alongside my experience of delivering usable technical services through startups or as an agency lead, Sam brings four generations of arable farming knowledge and a way of putting farmers at their ease enough to trust us. Our C-suite is experienced in both big tech and startups. Our advisory board brings experience of developing robots for Google's X and deploying commercial robotic services in the real world. And we have hired team leads with experience of delivering cutting edge technology reliably and at pace. Each one has approached us and are converts to our mission. Emma knows the pain of taking cutting edge technology and making it into a consumer facing product. Tom has spent years at Google and DeepMind working with petabytes of messy audio and video data to derive complex outcomes. Charlie is engineer number one on the electric car team at Dyson and has learned the painful lesson of building the best product that customers simply can't afford. Ray has 15 years of experience engineering rugged, robust machinery that works in all conditions. And Tom B um, provides cutting edge experience of developing swarm robotics to work inside nuclear reactors. Now, we know our customers really well. Uh, we know the four that are closest to us, and we know that while they're doing clever things, it's not based around automation and per robot intelligence. They still till the soil or use a sprayer to kill weeds, and their thinking stops at the robot, not how the farmer adopts their in um, products into their lives. We know that the big boys are still hung up on the tractor model and haven't yet been able to square the circle of the higher cost of running traditional plows, drills, and sprayers with higher energy needs using electricity. We also know that the vast majority of our competition simply aren't interested in arable crops. They are focused on the high value fruit and veg, which have their own and very distinct problems to solve. So I hope this has given you a view of the world of arable and farming robotics and what we at Small Robot Company are trying to do. Thank you very much for your time. I'd just like to say that small is good. I met Ben about four years ago. It was at Digital DNA, which is a pitch competition that happens in Northern Ireland. He flew over, pitched, and I should say thank you to Digital DNA, by the way, for helping us in terms of the media for this event. Um, he was an early stage startup at that point, and I can tell you that Ben, I think it was maybe the end of last year, uh, the company, small robot company, raised four and a half million, or just about that anyway. So it shows you the startups that we're going to be hearing from, Northern Irish ones, over the next two days, they could be the next Ben Scott Robinson, and they should be here presenting in two years, three years, four years from now. Uh, so Ben, it's awesome to have you with us today. We're gonna go live with Ben and have a chat. Um, Fran is an interesting guy, isn't he? And he's, I remember going out on the, having a drink with him as well. He's a good crack out <laughs> on the night as well. So uh, Ben, great to have you with us today. Oh, it's fantastic to be here, Alistair. It's, it's unbelievable to be returning to roots in some case. I mean, I think that the, that, that digital DNA session was uh, one of the very first ones we did. So it's, uh, it's brilliant to be back. Yep, if I remember rightly, you were in the top three in terms of the pitches. There was 25, 26 startups pitching. Um, the good thing I think from your point of view is it was an early opportunity to validate what you were doing and get some great feedback, have a few beers out in the nighttime as well, of course. Um, but what, what has been the, the biggest learning kind of part of the journey in terms of presenting your business? What have you learned over the last few years and, and how you kind of get people hooked in what you're doing? So I think that um, the, the importance of narrative, the importance of a story around what you're doing is extremely important. Uh, I think that you need to really understand where what you're doing meets needs and, and start with that. Um, so that you are linking 
um, the, the, the idea and the things that we're trying to create with um, the, the people who are going to get, get value out of it. Um, I think that also, you know, particularly when you're looking to pitch to investors, try not to get too hung up on talking about what you are providing and go into the detail about how that works as a business. Um, we got some absolutely brilliant advice uh, uh, about a year and a half ago um, saying that you know most startup pitches spend 80% of the time talking about what they're doing uh, and then 20% of the time talking about how it's going to work, uh, how the you know you're going to go to market, um, how your what your team's like and all that sort of stuff. And the reality is that VCs or investors they want it the other way around. You know they they can get your idea pretty quickly, um, but the important thing for them is how does that idea then become a company and a product and, and an opportunity for them. Perfect. Yeah, I mean I love how you've talked about this advice you might give for early stage entrepreneurs and talking mostly about how that might turn into a business and another piece of advice I sort of picked on picked up on throughout your presentation was knowing your customer and I love how as a, as a tech entrepreneur you've uh, managed to get through to these farmers in, in such a traditional industry um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that and and how you found it to um, and how, how you found connecting with these farmers and, and how you've got them to really buy into you and, and what you're doing you even mentioned how some of them have have prepaid, which I just find incredible. So if you could talk a little about that and how you've got to know, you mentioned about your team and how you have someone who knows the industry very well. Could you talk a little bit more about your customer and how you've really got them to buy into you? Certainly. I mean, I, I'm very lucky that my business partner, Sam, is a fourth generation arable farmer. Um, and he actually came into um, understanding that something needs to change and, and, and ultimately setting up a small robot company with me um, because of the pain points that he was suffering. Um, so my background is in user experience design and service design, um, but I'm slightly shamed to admit that uh, when Sam and I first started talking about the opportunities that, that robotics could, could offer, he was the first person to say, we really need to ask farmers and find out whether this is the right thing to do. <laughs> so, um, you know, we had this idea that, you know, robotics, automation, etc., could could bring value, but we didn't really know how. Um, and Sam spent six months on the road um, talking to initially 50, but, but over 150 farmers eventually uh, in quite a detailed way. I mean, my input was to create the sort of the interview form to, to do the, the quant uh, qualitative work, um, but he, he did all the legwork. And that gave us just huge insight. I mean, that gave us, as, as I mentioned in the presentation, that gave us literally what we needed to make. Um, and, you know, if you start by understanding the problem and you know it coming from the horse's mouth uh, and then structure what you're doing to deliver that um what it's 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 just as challenging as the other way around but you know you know that you have this support and you know you have this backing and you know you have this um a huge amount of um uh, uh sort of space within the industry to be able to uh, to, to move things forward and it's been hugely you know huge Last question, Ben. Um, I know you got to jump because you're a busy person at the moment. I think you're all over the place. You, you're doing some media coverage at the moment as well elsewhere. Um, I'm not too sure how much you can say, so we'll leave it at that perhaps. But um, I would obviously just like to finally ask, obviously something a little bit more tailored towards uh, smart places, uh, smart tech, and obviously the agricultural sector. Do you find that some of the things that are out there are slightly more gimmicky? And obviously, do you see that smart tech and smart places, smart innovation is going to have to be even more relevant to obviously cost savings or uh, improving the way that we live post pandemic? Do you think there's going to be a shift slightly that it's less about, you know, clever doorknobs and more about, you know, accessibility for everyone? Without meaning to sound like a broken record, I, I think that that it all comes back to answering a user need. You know, smart doorknobs um, uh, would be incredibly useful um, to be able to understand. You know, for a business whether or not everybody's out in the fire. Um, but uh, I think that you know the, the reality is that 
startups businesses you know they, they just happen to be funded in a different way at the start you know ultimately they need to provide something that people really need and really want um, and that might be you know sort of a couple of steps away from their existing world um, which means that you know sort of maybe customers don't necessarily understand the value of what you're doing right now um, but ultimately you know you, you have to provide that in the future I think that um, so just taking a step away from, from uh, the startup and you to, uh, for an analogy very quickly around this. Um, I was lucky enough to, to be part of the team at Hutchison Telecom that was working on the first 3G launch way back in 20, 2001, 2002. Um, and you know, there was a huge amount of interest in the technology. Um, you know, this idea that 3G could provide video, I mean, you know, quality, but, you know, video that, that, that people could use on their phone. Uh, and that drove a huge innovation around the phones itself. They became uh, color, they sort of had being able to navigate around the screen uh, and then ultimately touch screen. Um, but the view, the sort of the simplistic view, the value it could bring was, was based around video calls. You know, video calls were gonna be it, and that was gonna be the thing. Um, the reality was that, that video calls, you know, haven't really kicked off until 2015. You know, it's taken a long time for people to accept that as a way of communicating. And, and you know, the, the, the pandemic has obviously driven that hugely in terms of, you know, the uplift of, of, of Zoom and, and various other products like it. But the things that really launched 3G were much more mundane and also completely left field. So the, if you look at what actually made people take up 3G, it was Facebook. You know, the capacity to be able to go onto social media on your phone, not just drove 3G usage, it also drove Facebook. Uh, and, you know, it was a sort of this combining of technologies that made something happen in a scale and a way that, that was, was inconceivable. Um, so, you know, sometimes when people come up with ideas that seem really daft, then that actually those are ideas just need to be put into a slightly different social context or for things to happen to make them, them worthwhile and relevant um, uh, for them to happen. So I would say that, yes, there has to be a, a commercial reality to what you're doing, but also, you know, if you're looking a couple of steps into the future, try and understand, you know, try and understand how other things come together, what the confluence of technology, social situations, um, the environment in all its contexts, et cetera, has, um, and, 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 you know, see, if, see what works in that space. Rock and roll, Ben. Um, it's always great to chat. Um, and I should just say your tagline, unless it's changed, if I remember rightly, was uh, small robots instead of big tractors. Uh, has that changed or is it the same? So um, the, we, we still push small robots instead of big tractors as, as the direction we're going in, but our tagline is now small is good. Small is good. Happy yeah, days, Ben. Yeah. On that thank note, you very thank much. you. It's every... lovely to speak to you again. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Bye -bye. Right, guys, we're staying live just for a minute, and then we'll introduce Philip McLaughlin, who is from Esri Island. What Ben mentioned there, obviously, about um, the, the changes and obviously the pandemic, who'd have thought 12 months ago we'd be sitting here doing this instead of in front of a live audience? But in a way, it's reached us out to a wider audience, hasn't oh, it? Absolutely. I ran an event a couple of months ago when uh, we had people presenting and their, their grandmother was able to watch from Poland. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, what a brilliant thing. And it actually made me consider, even if we're able to open events up to a live audience, maybe next year, will we want to as much or will mm. we start to try and incorporate more technology into our everyday yeah. and into our event, uh, into our events and that sort of thing? Because it just really does uh, really widen the scope and, and the opportunity yeah. for globalization, really. Absolutely. And I'm going to take that opportunity then to kind of link in to Philip McLaughlin, who is, um, as far as I remember, a dairy man originally, but he works for Esri Island. He's not based here now. Um, Esri Island is a software and service organization that specializes in the application of geographical information systems or GIS. Um, so Philip is going to be talking a little bit about what they did over the last 12 months in terms of using GIS to support uh, during the pandemic and also how GIS, which is obviously how customers record where things are happening and analyzing why um, they can help with that process um how they're helping obviously post pandemic as well so i'll pass you over to philip who's going to present and then we'll chat to philip for a couple of minutes as well hi everyone my name is phil mclaughlin and over the next 10 minutes i am going to give a little overview of my location-based intelligence 
will help post-pandemic as much as it has done during it. So my name is Phil McLaughlin. Um, I work for a company called Esri in Ireland. Um, just like to thank Alistair and Sarah Gibbs for giving us all the show and being able to uh, discuss how we see uh, location-based intelligence happen. Uh, the company I work for uh, are a global leader in something called Geographic Information Systems, or GIS software. GIS software is location intelligence and digital mapping. Esri provides organizations of every size and industry, over 300,000 uh, companies, the tools to get deeper insights from their geographic and transactional data. And that helps them improve their operational and business uh, results. So our vision for location intelligence is to help organizations understand why things happen and when they happen, with the goal of giving business partners to better understanding of location. Uh, I'm going to start by giving you a little run through of what location intelligence is. So bear with me while I transfer the video and that little animation. Okay, so what is location intelligence? How is it changing the way we solve the problems of the future? Location intelligence uses spatial information to empower understanding, insights, decision making, and prediction. It has applications everywhere from retail site selection and solving traffic bottlenecks to maintaining and repairing vital infrastructure. Location-based insights are, are used in many ways. They can create safer, more efficient supply chains. They can even help track floods and evacuate residents and target those most vulnerable. They can reduce damage and save lives, making cities and citizens more resilient. In farming, precision agriculture will help deliver water and fertilizer only where it's needed. This will lower production costs and maximize crop yields, which will be necessary to feed another 2 billion people by 2050. Location intelligent organizations help their staff create, manage, and share information, making them smarter, more productive, and more efficient. 97% of companies believe location intelligence is crucial to their success. Most say they plan to invest in location intelligence technologies. We've only just begun to explore the potential of combining spatial information with prediction, just as we would have once been hard pressed to imagine all the uses for smartphones. We're still discovering that location intelligence, combined with emerging technologies like AI, will uncover new insights and provide a better map of the future. Okay, now that we have a better understanding of what location intelligence actually is, let's have a little look at how it has helped throughout the pandemic. So I'm going to go through five steps that were pretty much used uh, across the globe to be able to help um, with the response. Uh, the first thing that location intelligence was used to do was to be able to map the cases. So GIS was used primarily as a, a system of record, the, the ability to be able to capture who has been infected and uh, where they live. The second thing that location intelligence was used to do was to map the spread. So taking a regional or national or global approach to be able to see where uh, areas are, are seen uh, taking the uh, virus code. The third step that was used during the pandemic was the capability for a location intelligence to use to identify where vulnerable populations were. So GIS was used to be able to uh, target those areas where the people were of highest need. So what that meant was we were able to identify who needed food parcels so they could be uh, shielded from uh, potential 
information. Location intelligence is also used to be able to map capacity of the uh, hospital infrastructure uh, across various different nations. So with various different models, we're able to project how the number of people will be requiring supports, and we're able to sort of determine at what stage hospitals would be uh, reaching their limits and, um, and that sort of helped influence policies. And finally, location intelligence was, was, was used primarily as a, as a method for communication. Maps were used to be able to communicate the growth, the spread, the increase um, of infection rates across the globe. So how this was achieved, well, this was achieved by, by many organizations and, and quite a lot of our clients, we, we refer to them as GIS professionals. And these GIS professionals um, built dozens of applications. Um, and we broke them down into sort of three different types of applications. There were hubs, there were dashboards, and there was various different mapping applications and models. All right, the first hub that I'm going to look at is one that we actually provided uh, from Esri. Uh, and this was used to be able to provide various different resources. So Esri had got a disaster recovery program, uh, or disaster response program, whereby we provide software to organizations that can use it to be able to support populations. And this was used by hundreds of organizations across the world, including in Ireland and the United Kingdom, to be able to access a uh, location intelligence platform to be able to share information with the public. Uh, one of the examples uh, of the hubs that have been produced locally is uh, the Republic of Ireland's COVID-19 data hub, brought information from the Health Protection Surveillance Center in the Republic and the Health Service Executive. And it was a, it was a collaboration between the Central Statistics Office and Ireland Survey Ireland, the NARO and, and Esri Ireland to be able to build this, uh, this platform. And this platform was able to provide statistics, it was able to provide charting information. It was also able to provide spatial information to be able to give you an idea of the uh, the recent incidents of confirmed cases by uh, by local areas. Looking more closely uh, to Northern Ireland, we've got an example from uh, Mid Ulster Council who released their own um, uh, Arctis Hub to be able to share information around uh, who was there to help within their own area. So they were able to create a little application which allowed you to select your address and be able to find which food banks were in your local area, which community groups were in your local area, and um, what shops were still open in your local area, and where was your nearest uh, pharmacies. And moving on to dashboards that have been created. Uh, one of the most popular dashboards or mapping applications of all time was created by Johns Hopkins University in the United States. And this has been the go-to resource for uh, news organizations across the world and members of the public to be able to figure out uh, what is happening today and what's been happening over the, the past uh, number of weeks. And this application is just a, one of Esri's default templates, which is used to be able to input information, be able to describe that and serve that back out to the public. Uh, again, looking closer to home, we've got the likes of Donegal County Council bringing together statistics from the Republic and from Northern Ireland to be able to give a local view. Uh, this is just the, the sort of toes, the power that uh, location information is bringing local organizations. So, looking to the future of a post pandemic world, location intelligence will be used to share where businesses are back open again, such as this example from Cosmic Coast and Glens. It'll be used to be able to build the green infrastructure of the future, 
just like we see here by Teresa and Sripanta, Sripanta identifying other second position prints. We were able to design the urban cities of the future, for example, by um, building digital twins with cities so that we can view um, how developments are going to impact upon our populations. We will be able to understand how developments uh, can impact upon other businesses. We will be able to see uh, a real time response to emergency incidents. And we will be able to respond to the next biggest challenge, which will be uh, climate change and the climate emergency we face over, over the next 50 years. So thank you for listening to me for the past 10 minutes or so. And I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the talks today. And I will hopefully get the chance to catch up with you later if there's any questions. Thank you. Great stuff, Philip. Um, I'm hoping Philip can join us in the room here now live and we can have a quick chat with him for one or two minutes. Uh, and then Philip's going to join us on the panel uh, alongside all the other guests as well. So, uh, Philip, hopefully you can join us. Ooh. Let's have a look. Hiya. There he is. Hello. Hello, sir. How are you? I am great. Thank you very much. You're good. You're, good. You're staying for the panel, aren't you, Philip? Yeah, yeah, if you'll have me, I'll, I'll stay, I'll stay as much as... I as think you. we will, sir, I think we will, and thank you, obviously, Edry Island, for supporting the event um, and your involvement today as well. Just one quick question before we go on to the panel, because I'm just very conscious of time as well, is you mentioned at the end there that in the future, part of the job of Esri will be to respond to climate change, and I just wondered how you imagined that you would be using that mapping and that data to help in, in terms of climate specifically. Uh, there's a, with regards to climate, tomorrow is actually Earth Day, um, so there's a, a Global Earth Day initiative, and uh, the Earth Day organization are actually using uh, location intelligence to be able to sort of bring people together, to be able to, to, be able to try and, and raise awareness and to be able to highlight events where uh, people can actually um, highlight what they're going to be able to do, able to, uh, prevent um, any change happening or be able to impact results. So Esri as a company, we provide software and services for organizations to be able to, um, to, be able to make smart decisions. Uh, so for example, some of the tools that we provide, that location intelligence, it, it's, it's not just about being able to capture information, it's about being able to share it and being able to make, uh, make decisions upon it. So we're working with the likes of the Climate Action Regional Offices in the Republic of Ireland to be able to capture information on climate events throughout, um, throughout the Republic. And then all that information is gathered up and shared back to all the local authorities and the Office of Public Works so that you know, people can get a real-time view of what's happening and they also be able to see you know, what's happening over a number of years. Um, Excellent. Yeah. So we shouldn't we shouldn't look at we shouldn't look at technology as a threat to the you know the way that we live perhaps but see it as an opportunity to to gather better data to help protect people in the environment as well and I think that's a really good starting point obviously for this discussion that we're going to have now as well so I'm going to obviously hope that we can get all of the panelists to jump in at this point um, that we have joining us today uh, so just to list them out while they join us on the panel. Uh, we have Irene from CSENSE, uh, Stephen from Civic Dollars, Severio, who is the EU Intelligent City Challenge Project Lead uh, for Derry, uh, Emma Marshall, who is the Accelerator Program Lead for at Connected Places, Michal McLaughlin from CropSafe, big up to Michal, uh, lovely to have you with us today, and obviously he's a young entrepreneur in Northern Ireland, part of a two team that are doing great stuff, and Terry Cannon, uh, co-founder of Cattle Eye. So you can see that we've picked a mix of, uh, let's say, agricultural, rural tech, and smart city solution. Stephen Mapeak at the top there. Lovely to see you, Stephen. Stephen's had some great press recently, haven't you, Stephen? Do you want to start with that? Just explaining where you've been covered recently in the news. 
Yeah, it, it all came out of uh, the guys in Leeds Council put it through their scrutiny committee and that ended up being picked up by the local papers in, in Leeds and then the Telegraph reporters got in touch, done an interview with them and put it in the Daily Telegraph, the Sunday Telegraph, which ended up going on Good Morning Britain and they were discussing civic dollars and how to incentivize people to be more active. Excellent. So this is a little bit like Good Morning Britain now, isn't it, really, to be fair, <laughs> Fran? So, um, oh, you're better I'm going to start with worry. Emma. <laughs> better look, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm we not like too him. sure. We like him. I'm on deck. That's it. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with Emma in the middle. Um, just introduce yourself first, if that's okay. And then we're going to go in around in a metaphorical circle very quickly just to introduce everyone. So Emma. Hi, guys. Um, pleasure to be here. So my name is Emma Marshall. I work at Connected Places Catapult um, as Accelerator Program Lead. So um, Connected Places Catapult is one of nine catapults in the UK. We're in a non profit organisation and Connected Places Catapult, we operate in the spaces of built environment, mobility, critical infrastructure, health and wellbeing, public places. Basically, that covers everything really, doesn't it? Um, and I work in the Accelerator team, basically running accelerated programmes to de-risk innovation and, and promote the, the fabulous um, SMEs and startups that are operating out there and, and hopefully um, remove any barriers or try and remove barriers to um, getting them commercialized. Getting them commercialized. Excellent. Rather, rather than just going around in a circle and everyone introducing themselves, because we'll drop off about eight minutes, I want you to introduce yourselves when we ask you a question and just do that really quickly as well. So I'm going to ask Emma that question as a follow-up. Like, what does a smart place, city or business um, or rural area or society mean to you? So for me, I think it's it's obviously utilizing um, utilizing data, IoT, technology in general, really, um, to uh, to share information, optimize operations, and I think for me, ultimately, it's provide the public, consumer, end user, or end beneficiary with a better quality of service, um, experience, and hopefully improve welfare as well. Excellent, great answer. Um, before I pass over to Fran, I'm just going to get Michal to introduce himself and, and share a little bit about what you're doing at CropSafe. Hey everyone, thanks for, for having me, Al and, and Fran. Um, but yeah, um, myself and, and John, we, uh, we co-founded CropSafe, but yeah, we grew up on farms and uh, we've been programming software our whole lives pretty much. And uh, one thing we realized was a lot of farmers are, um, yeah, they're still doing a lot of things manually. They're say checking the weather every day or they're going out to their fields to, to monitor their crops and and we realized we could really speed this up with uh, using satellite imagery and uh, soil sensors and, and connecting all the data um, and pretty much giving health alerts uh, on the crops um so yeah that's, that's what we're working on at the minute we're um yeah we're still still improving on the product and, and changing things up uh, as we get more feedback but that's where we're at at the minute excellent Mihu, i'm going to ask you this question it's not to embarrass you but how old are you now uh, 20 now. Yeah. 20 now. So we met Mihil when he was seven, seven, 16, 17, I think, Fran. Is that right? Probably about when yeah, we met with Pop Safe. That, yeah. And uh, obviously they've pitched at various things that we've done and they've been part of the scene in Northern Ireland. They, they won a hackathon in Northern Ireland to start with, went out to California. Um, I talk about them in schools when I go into schools because I just think they're, they're your county dairy boys and doing an amazing thing, obviously, in terms of like how someone young can have such a brilliant idea. So Michal, congratulations. Fran, do you want to grab one of the panelists there and ask them? Yeah, I suppose this is kind of an open question and it's something I kind of chatted a little bit about with Ben earlier. And it was about sort of the receptiveness to new technologies. And in his case, it was with farmers. He was bringing technology into a very traditional industry. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, new technologies, uh, specifically consumer facing, and how do you find the receptiveness of consumers to smart cities and new technologies? And how do you bring consumers around the idea of this new technology when there perhaps could be some resistance in terms of maybe privacy or you know they're watching us and they know our data and, and all that sort of stuff. So if someone wants to take the floor on their thoughts with that question, that would be great. Can I go? Please do. Yeah, my, uh, so my name is Saverio Romeo. I'm the lead expert for Dairy London Dairy in the ICC. is a European project of uh, more than 100 cities. Uh, I, um, though my experience is around IoT, specifically smart, smart small, medium-sized city and smart farming. 
uh, I'm, uh, in particular smart, smart agriculture. I'm doing personally stuff down in South Italy in smart farming, a bit like Michael, but I'm 48, not young like him. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think the adoption, um, there, there are there there are two two contrasting views I think in technology adoption. There is the side of the imposing technology to people, uh, and and that has a lot of reaction by people. I mean, the technology community tends sometimes to impose technological things through a narrative that is always. Uh, design around, we are revolutionizing your life, you are changing dramatically your life, but you don't really explain to them what the technology is about, really. Uh, and, uh, um, and then there are cases in which uh, you explain the technology, you tell them, not, not the technology, but what the technology does, taking it about the farmers. If I talk about the farmers, about the IoT, he will laugh at me or she will laugh at me. <laughs> if I tell him, you know, if we do a sensor network on, on your vineyards in order to uh, detect uh, or pre-detect peronospera condition and so on, and you tell me you can achieve these objectives, so the, the discussion there, the, uh, the level of adoption becomes completely different. There, there is someone who is, yeah. is listening to you. And, and, and that discussion needs to, needs to come with case studies. I think particularly in farming, I notice in my experience that if you tell farmers, look, how other farmers have done in this way, yeah, and they've achieved these objectives. It doesn't matter what is the yeah. connectivity form, the sensors, it's not your problem. I mean, I can explain later if you want, but if you start <laughs> from solving the problem rather than from the technology, I think the adoption discussion becomes completely different, much easier in my experience. Yeah. So nearly starting with for, why, in a and sense. And this goes for cities, uh, citizen applications, you know, the smart parking, smart waste management, you, you can put all of these. So it's, I think it's about giving the knowledge of the objective, not Absolutely. of uh, how you get there. Point. Great yeah. answer. Um, I'm going to then lead on to Irene and obviously with C-Sense. And your, your, your business is very much obviously around, I'm going to guess, protection and selling obviously that protection into users, but also cities as well. So obviously, do, 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 does your consumer know obviously what they're using in a sense or if they just basically gone along with the ride pardon the pun obviously in terms of obviously how how people are using technology and mobility for example um thanks Alistair. yeah so maybe just to briefly introduce myself we um i'm from csense we're a cycling technology and data company and we're really on a mission to make cycling better so what we're about is tackling some of the biggest challenges for cyclists around safety and theft and using um, powerful data insights that we can gather um, from our devices um, that cities can use then to help um, improve conditions for cycling. Um, so we started about seven years ago. We're now selling in our products into uh, 70 countries now around the world. And um, we are already working with a number of uh, you, uh, leading smart cities around the world who are using these data insights. From the consumer perspective, um, from our, you know, we sell our bike lights as a consumer product, um, as well as the projects that we do work with cities. And on the, the consumer side, um, you know, we, we make it optional for people to opt in and share their data, but it's really about um, sharing aggregated data insights and making it clear that by doing that, there's actually a benefit to them because we know cyclists don't like potholes. We know that they don't, um, you know, fear and, you know, being concerned about safety is a big issue. So if we can say, you know, we can actually work with cities to use data insights about your ride that um, can help cyclists as a whole um, and as a community. And there's a lovely camaraderie among the cycling community and obviously wanting to see conditions improve. So, um, you know, the, I think if you're clear about the benefit and you're quite transparent about how you want to use those data insights, we see a very high opt-in rate um, from our, from our uh, retail customers. And then obviously for the projects we do with cities, there's 100% opt-in because everybody is choosing to participate on that project in, with the aim of sharing the data. 
Yeah, I actually think that links really well into what Philip was saying earlier about sort of the greater good and how mm -hmm. they've used data and insights then for, you know, COVID and, you know, for then uh, global warming and, and data into that as well. So it's really interesting and it sort of kind of uh, mirrors what Saverio said about how you need to sort of think about the why mm -hmm. and you know, why are we doing it and what's the greater objective here and how yeah. are we using yeah. that data to really benefit everybody? So yeah. that was a really great point. Thank you. Yeah, great. I'm going to ask Stephen then the follow up to that really, which is like Stephen, obviously with civic dollars and I'll give you the opportunity a second to explain what that's doing at the moment, obviously in, in terms of pandemic response. But um, I remember reading some of those articles that were in the news and there was kind of like a, this council is paying you to get fit kind of like obviously message which is it's not a bribery thing it's more of a let's support each other for the the, the greater good and obviously you're using data to help with that process so do you want to do you want to kind of share how important it is obviously of what you're doing but also how important it is to get local engagement and community buy-in as well yeah sure um so yeah i'm stephen from civic dollars and it's a, a social currency platform that we've developed to improve the health of citizens by incentivizing activity using geofencing and, and gamification for smart cities so you earn civic dollars by visiting parks volunteering in the community or reporting issues to the council but you can only exchange them for rewards that will help improve either your lifestyle or the community so yes yeah, great great point alistair and we always look um I suppose a lot of talk about stakeholders when it comes to any of these smart city projects, um, especially when dealing with, with cities and, and councils. So like in, we've always built, and in my opinion, the, the communities were the key behind any successful project. Like we're at the stage when, when trust is so important and people are generally anti-authoritarian and don't like to be told what to do. Um, so that's why trust is, is so important. But what, what we found is that if the message comes across from the community and driven from the community, from that peer level, that they do have a, a far greater response. Um, I suppose like Irene and the, the cycling community, um, once people trust and learn that the, the data has been used in a, in a proper way, that you've seen the uptake that, that they've had. So yeah, you can, I suppose the headlines came that we were, councils were paying people to visit the parks, but we want to say, no, we're incentivizing people to go to the park to help improve their health. Um, so there's there's always a way to swing swing a story, but in the end, it's it's trying to to improve that health angle. Yeah, yeah, the importance of language. Yeah, I'm gonna just jump and say, Fran, before I pass over to yourself again, but to Terry, um, in terms of communities, um, and this is something for me, Hall as well. How do you sell a tech solution to? I'm gonna guess quite a traditional sector in terms of farming, or is that my assumption and it's wrong? Yeah, that's a really, really good, good question, Alistair. A little bit of background about myself, first of all. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm. I, I studied engineering and I set up my first business in 2004, which was a software service for managing livestock. And I grew that up over 10 years and sold it in 2015. Um, but I exited then successfully in March 2019. But what we do in Catalai is we provide a very easy way to collect data about livestock from the farmers and we do it in such a way that the farmer isn't even involved we just use a, a low-cost 2d security camera and we pull that footage up into the cloud we run various uh, neural networks on that footage to find out things about the car like uh, its welfare levels its, its, its uh, body condition score and, and and these are of interest for the farmer so the farmer can take actions on it uh, but also to the retailer and the consumer because there's been a big drive recently and a lot of it's been driven by the, the, the vegan movement uh, about a real focus on animal welfare. And I've seen a massive change where um, farmers in the U.S. especially are very much focused now on making sure that their cows, their happy cows, are being well looked after. So what our tool does is allows the farmer to put up a camera. We can analyze that information and then work out the welfare levels of the farmer. So we've been around since 2019. We are engaged with um, people like Tesco. In the UK, people like m and in the UK and also in the US are working with some of the largest dairy farmers there. Um, but yeah, we've, we've raised about, we're just closing a 1.8 billion round uh, as we speak uh, over the next week. Um, but we've got massive engagement that's primarily focused on dairy. And when you ask the question, are farmers, are they, are they receptive to this type, type of technology? There's a broad spectrum of farmers. Um, you know, you've got people, you've part-time guys that are, 
or maybe just doing this as a little bit of a hobby. You've older folk who've been in the market for a while or are in the, using this as a lifestyle. And, but right at the other end of the spectrum, you've got really, really cutting edge, um, both individual and companies, especially when you get, get into the US, you get into some of the, 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 the larger dairy herds and they're very receptive to technology because of the values you can bring them. Because what we can do, we can, tell, you know, we can demonstrate that if they use our technology and we can spot the lame cows, we can save them about $100 per cow per year. So one of our investors is 65,000 cows. So if we can save them $100 per year, uh, that he simply has to mount uh, a few digital cameras or a few security cameras around his farm, then it's, it's very much an easy sell. So yeah, big spectrum. And if you can demonstrate the value, then the sell becomes easy. Great stuff. Alrighty. Well, I suppose then for me, in terms of a city like Derry, London, Derry, or various rural areas, all of you have a, a common denominator, I suppose, in using data and technology to make the world a more efficient, transparent, educated, connected place. So in 10 years time, in terms of smart development across cities and rural areas, what would you say is realistic to have happened? So say in 2031, how do you, how do you envision the world in terms of smart technology? Anybody can jump in. Can I say my 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 opinion? Really, I, 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 I don't do not want to forecast, but I would suggest maybe an approach, a different approach. Okay, first of all, I want to say that the agricultural sector, from an IoT perspective, is probably one of the most advanced. Yeah, the most uh, excited about new technology, and you know, the presentation you showed at the beginning is a sign of it. Uh, really interesting stuff in agriculture. Yeah, I, I would not use any more the term traditional sector. It's not. If we use traditional in the sense of adoption of tech, uh, my, 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 my answer to the question is: until now, pre-pandemic, pre uh, we have lived in a, a city-centric development approach. Innovation, economic growth was. Uh, fought to be centralized in cities, yeah, and primarily big cities. This narrative has, all, has kind of motivated the movement from, uh, let's say, the periphery of the world, the rural areas of the world towards cities, and creating mm -hmm. a big problem on that side, yeah, on the side of the, of, uh, um, of the periphery and the rural area. Uh, the pandemic has provoked a change, a lot of people moving back, or the idea that there is now that small places, for example, from where I come from, I'm working on a project that a small town of 2,000 people is trying to attract people to come back through smart working and so on. So there is this sort of change, but this sort of change, if, if can happen, this needs to, then we need to have a rebalance of attention between city and periphery. We need to have a continuum of smartness between city and the periphery and the rural areas. You know, if I want to do smart rural areas today, it's not just about providing the broadband. Sometimes I have in conversation, you know, we do smart rural and, you know, is the broad, it's not just the broadband is a backbone that you should have installed years ago. Instead, because of the centrality of the city, we have left the rural areas behind. Yeah. So for me, my, my wish for the next 10 years is to create this continuum of smartness among communities living in a different way, from the rural areas to the city, from the area around Derry to the central of Derry, and so on. So in that way, you can really create the opportunity for innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic growth horizontally, not centrally to the city. So and this requires yeah. all a political reflection and so on. But this is, I do not have a response to your question. This is my wish for the next 10 years. I love that wish, though. That's not a bad wish. Connectivity between people, cities and rural areas is not necessarily a bad thing, is it? And the buy-in from both. I, Emma, then, I'm going to ask you that before I jump to, to Philip, obviously, from an Esri perspective. Um, and Emma, I'm going to ask, obviously, at Connected Places, have you seen over the last 12 months innovations coming through that wouldn't have been there pre-pandemic and the type of ideas that now you're forecasting are gonna change the way that we live, uh, love, work, whatever. Um, have they changed or are they gonna change now because of the pandemic and the way that we're living as people? I think 
I think they will. So far, what we've seen is maybe not so much um, so much that, uh, but we've seen technologies, I guess, pivot slightly to what their use cases are. Um, and I think what Philip was talking about earlier, um, I've seen that with one of our companies that we work with, with DHS2, um, in using data with that pandemic lens, particularly around social distancing, which we don't know how long that's going to be around, but um, we've seen people using big data and digital twins to, um, to look at the, that aspect of, of social distancing and how can we make sure people are social distancing or, or how do we need to reevaluate how we plan places so that people can social distance. Um, and then I yeah. think and then it's a really interesting point, um, what, sorry, so sorry. apologies if I've mispronounced your name there, um, but just to jump back a little bit to what was said then around um, that connection between rural and cities. I think getting the fundamentals right for the rural and towns and leveling up like their, their technology, their broadband, um, whenever we talk about engagement, if, if you don't have somebody who has strong broadband to do homework from home, how can you expect them to be engaged in smart city if they're um, um, not based? That sounds a very third yeah. world. Yeah. Know, so yeah, I hope it, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, no, 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 I, I get what you're saying. And obviously, like, we've got to get the fundamentals right. And I'm assuming that comes from a governmental and a corporate level. And that's why, obviously, Esri and organisations like Esri, I'm assuming is so important, Philip, in providing, obviously, the accessibility to the data. But you need, you need the broadband access, all of those basic things that perhaps we in the technology sector take for granted that everyone's got. Is that fair? Sorry, sorry, just sorry. to say, I'm not saying that the broadband does, is not needed. I, I hope oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that the broadband <laughs> was with us 10 years ago. That today, yeah. we are not going still to debate that we need to roll out broadband. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Yeah, so, so, so broadband at the minute is one of the largest engineering sort of tasks going on throughout Ireland. So in the Republic, they've got the National Broadband Initiative. In the North, we've got Project Stratum and OpenReach investing hundreds of millions of pounds and putting broadband where it's needed. But, but Alistair, you're right. Look, this, this interconnectivity of businesses, of public, of government, uh, needs, needs to increase. And, and the way to do that is by sharing information. And look, the good thing about our company is, is we enable people to be able to share information really easily. We take the, the medium of place to be able to share that information. So figuring out where things are, but technology has enabled organizations to really uh, quickly share information privately if it's required through the likes of GDPR regulations, but also publicly and getting engagement through those types of hubs. Uh, that, that that have been uh, appearing uh, recently over the past couple mm -hmm. of years. Brilliant. I actually just on that, uh, Philip. I have a question then for for Mehol. Um, Philip, you talked a little bit a, a little bit about engagement. I'd like to sort of ask Mehol, how have you found getting your ideal customer to engage with your technology and, and to buy into it as as a new thing? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. A good, great question. Um, so. We uh, made a few mistakes at the start. We were showing farmers all these fancy dashboards and all this data and satellite imagery, and and uh, realized that they weren't just they weren't interested in it at all. Um, so you, we kind of um, yeah, we we realized that you have to understand what what's the farmer's uh, goal, what's their job to be done, and uh, then how can you help them with that? Um, and that's when you that's when you'll get them excited. So uh, say a farmer has to spray their crops or harvest. Um, they'll want to know when, when the weather's right. So um, their job is to check the weather uh, pretty much every day until, uh, until it's right, based on time as well. Um, and yeah, so what we've pretty much done is uh, help them get that job done as quickly as possible um, and, and as, as, as easily as possible. So we'll just send them a simple text message that the weather conditions are perfect for, um, for, for spraying today or for harvesting your crops. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we realized that if, if you uh, really get to what their problem is and, and what their job is on the farm and, and how you can help, um, that they'll, they'll be receptive. And especially if, if you can prove that you're increasing yield, saving time, um, that, that's, that's when farmers will be interested. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of what Severio was saying about, you know, yeah. 
imposing tech versus telling you how. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of then what Terry was saying about, you know, these people, they don't really care about all those little in-depth things. But if Terry can say, look, I can save you a hundred pounds a cow. And if you can tell you, if you can tell the farmers, well, I can, you know, predict maybe weather a bit better and tell you when the best conditions are. That's the things they really care about. Yeah. And then I was going to ask Irene, the follow on to that then is when you're selling sea sense in a sense, I'm going to guess it's selling to the local councils, the local government, mayors, those organizations where you can then say if we map this data correctly you're going to have safer roads less deaths it's not the technology you're saving it's the solution is that fair yeah i mean look i mean it was a just yesterday um uk has announced you know the most ambitious climate change target coming into law around net zero and so cities really are sort of saying how do we how do we address that target when you think about it, transport is actually one of the biggest contributors to CO2 emission. So starting at that top level and saying, okay, we've got to tackle some really big societal challenges. We've got, you know, pollution, we've got obesity, we've got um, congestion in our cities. And so more and more cities are saying then, okay, we can see that active travel is a solution to a lot of that. But then how do we actually make that shift? How do we make it attractive for people to want to get on a bike? If you don't currently cycle, what's going to make you want to? And it's that is a real challenge for cities, you know, trying to tackle that issue that the need is there, but how do they make that leap? So what we're doing is saying to them, look, we know that safety is one of the biggest barriers. We can help you tackle and understand with data about how to target your interventions we know where the dangerous hotspots are. We can help you pinpoint how to improve those. And we can save you money because you can then um, monitor how they're performing over time and know the best um, performance and interventions that you can make going forward. And so it's really, um, it's a way to see how you come at the big problem and show how your solution is, is, is answering those needs um, yeah. rather than just coming in and saying, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to get some cyclists using our bike lights and collect a whole lot of data for you. You need to you need to position it in terms of, um, and I think as your first speaker said as well, um, yeah. from the tiny robot company was I think he was bang on with that. You're trying you're trying to answer their needs. Absolutely. And just before I turn back to Fran for the last question, and I think we're going to do that as a as an open for everyone to answer. So that one there, it's in terms of obviously Stephen Mapeak. I just wanted to say obviously. Um, I remember chatting to you about three, four, five months ago, and what you were launching with Leeds, as far as I remember, was the ability for individuals to be able to see how many people were in a park so that they could either go there or not. And that was in direct response to the pandemic and the need to obviously social distance. Has it, has it changed from that? Or is, is that a, an add-on thing that you do now with civic dollars and you could see continuing? Yeah, I definitely think it'll be continuing. It's something we built in whenever, I mean, last April, whenever we seen what was what was happening. And luckily we were mid-development of Civic Dollars, so we were able to, to add that in uh, quite easily just by putting in the, the traffic light system to show which parks are busier and which ones are quieter to give people a more informed decision of where to go. But that's something that we wanted to, to pull out further and, and totally embed into the system that, that we can take in uh, more data from Google and Strava and everywhere else to, to give a, a better idea of the, of the people within the park, but also to adjust behavior and that we can increase the earn value of the quieter parks and try and nudge people to, to visit those. So it's something, yeah, we built initially and now we want to expand that out. And I think it's going to be important over the next few years as well to, to show that data. But just to go back on what Fran's point about what we think in 10 years time um, is going to happen in Derry, I definitely think anything community-based because you know how community-driven the city is and no matter what happens, they all seem to band together either in celebration or grief. So hopefully it's something that will be able to impact on the health of the population there. And if you look at the work that Aaron Peace and Tony Bjornsson are doing over in the Citrix Centre um, around genome modelling, which is going to have a huge impact on the issue of cardiovascular disease and strokes in the, in the Northwest. So stuff like that, I think, is going to be huge over the next 10 years. 
brilliant and you've actually nearly just answered That's our, what I was gonna say, our, our yeah. last question <laughs> yeah because we were actually going to open the the floor up and ask you all is there anybody or any organization you can think of currently that's doing something really innovative or smart to support the development of, of cities or rural areas? Now's your chance for a shout out. I think I, well, what I'm seeing is, is uh, in the dairy industry specifically, and I'm focusing on climate change, is the, the, the efforts the dairy processors are doing to reduce carbon footprint in, in, in the dairy. Um, they're, they're providing incentive um, I know, for example, Danone uh, will pay $24 a ton of carbon that you can take out of their supply chain. So there's a real effort. Um, it's a genuine effort. It's not just the CSR. So I remember speaking to the head of protein for, for Nestle, um, and he was telling me they're trying to farm in areas that are suffering terrible climate change. So it's very, very difficult as these, as these temperatures grow. So if it, there's a genuine effort that I can see in the, in particularly the dairy processors, um, to really, uh, really reduce the, the carbon footprint in dairy, which has really impressed me. Excellent, excellent. Emma, let's jump to yourself. Um, I've been working closely with, with Milton Keynes Council over the past couple of years, um, and they're a couple of years, a few months even, um, and they've been really embracing technology and, and change and, and really pivoting themselves as a, as a tech hub, which I think is really admirable. Um, you know, from an accelerator point of view in, in my little world, you know, to have to have a, a local authority to come to you and actually ask for an, an accelerated program. Um, I've not seen that personally before. So to have them have them really be ambassadors and almost a link between the economy and the startup community and the big businesses of the local area. Um, I think it's really great in that, you know, we're not just focusing on um, innovations in one specific sector. We're looking at how all of these innovations that are intended by sustainable recovery. Um, how can we use big data in relation to mobility and health? So it's not just you know, focused on industry specific. Um, so yeah, from a personal point of view, Milton Keynes Council is, is doing great things. Excellent, excellent. I'm gonna quickly jump in there before anyone else says anything and say, there is Dubai and Council, obviously with Romario and the team there with Intelligent Cities and the work they're doing, um, looking at various things, but obviously including smart cities in that as well. Um, Severia, we'll come back to you in a second, but um, Irene, anyone that you'd like to shout out? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, to Emma's point about the link between health and transport, um, I, I'm seeing some really good work being done by TORS, the Active Wellbeing Society in, in Birmingham. They're actually giving out free bikes to um, areas that have deprived communities, um, and the found that there's a huge uptake in then the usage of those and um, you know, life-changing stuff really, because people, the impact on health, but also being able to transport to get to jobs and things like this is, is really transformational. So I think it sounds simple, but giving a bike can make that difference. Um, and then also maybe another shout out for, there's a We Count project um, running in Dublin, but I think some other cities in Ireland as well. And as citizens are putting a device on their home window and it can count the number of cars um, or pedestrians or even bikes that go past their own window. So it's empowering citizens to have some data to maybe say, hey, my street's quite busy or thinking about pollution and things like that. So it's a simple thing, but gives uh, citizens some data as well to um, yeah, have a voice. Yeah. And obviously yeah. our own product as well, but I'll yeah. go through that. <laughs> Brilliant, uh, Miho. Yeah, um, I'd say a few um, in, in, in Dublin as well. I, I remember speaking a few times to Michael Guren and, and the things they're doing in Smart Docklands Dublin. And um, I think if um, the, yeah, Belfast and Dublin were able to kind of go off each other um, and uh, kind of yeah increase the, the, the smartness of the cities together, kind of in collaboration, it would be be pretty cool but also a sh shout out to everyone here I think uh, I've been following CSense especially for quite a while and really interested in what they've been doing with the with with the data and, and the centers and um yeah sh shout out to everyone here that's, that's working on it uh working on smart everything smart but oh, thank you very yeah much. we probably should have said that you know apart from you all <laughs> um <laughs> Ach, that's for granted as, as isn't well it? as you all that is <laughs> we don't like to big us um, we're modest <laughs> <laughs> we definitely should 
Um, is to Severio, any thoughts? Okay, uh, so uh, um, so I'm new to Derry. Unfortunately, only online relationships so far. But um, so what I observe in six months of uh, sort of uh, research work that um, and comparing also to other city I've worked with in the past. I mean, there, there is a, a an incredible uh, explosion of activities. I would say. The ICC project looks primarily upskilling and reskilling initiatives, and even there, you know, there is a lot to look at, a lot to a lot to be to be proud of. Uh, probably my my observation is that sometimes there are silos activity, and so that sense of community that Steve was talking about in that in that sense needs to be more developed. So this uh, more of a horizontal way of looking at these activities in, into the and then and maybe they can work together uh, from from external um, an external view uh, i've had experience in the eu demeter uh, smart agriculture agriculture flagship program is finished now but i think there will be a new one but i think there is a lot of inspiration there for smart farming and uh, I don't know if Terry and Michael know that, but there have been a lot of inspirations uh, from all over Europe, from UK. I don't know if the next iteration will involve UK now, but great, great seven years there. Um, from uh, a smart city point of view, uh, I would like to really invite you to look at Finland. Yeah, we are talking about uh, medial, small, medium-sized cities, uh, apart from Helsinki. Yeah, but, but the stuff doing there in in every direction in a smart city view. So it can be the technology side, could be the community developing side, uh, people engagement. Uh, really, really incredible activities there. Uh, a city like mm -hmm. Espo is fantastic. On open data is an incredible platform. Really, I so. Uh, th these are a bit of a suggestion I would give. There is a lot of positive yeah. things around. <laughs> Happy days. So I'm going to, Philip and Stephen, I'm going to put you under pressure now. 20 seconds each. <laughs> Something that you think we need to know about right now. 20 seconds. Yeah, just to keep it local, I couldn't go past what the guys in Seagate were doing with Jason McIntosh and Claire Lundy on the Smart Foil project, bringing it back to the community and the school level with Roshan Crawford from STEM Aware. Teaching the students about data and cloud and designing their own smart city projects is a great way for the building blocks for any smart city to, to start with. Yeah, Excellent, great right. pitch, great, great back of the net. Philip, off you go. Yeah, look, so so deep learning and neural networks has been mentioned a number of times throughout our presentations today. So um, yeah, look, artificial intelligence is here and it's going to change the way that we work over the next 10 years, I think, style. Um, so, yeah, if there's one thing they, they keep an eye on, it's, it's all the enhancements and technological innovations that's going to come uh, down the line. Excellent, excellent. Um, we thank you all for your time today. I hope you like my new living room. This is something I put together, <laughs> did the graffiti myself. Actually, I should give credit to Carl Porcer from UV Arts for this work here. Um, he's doing some amazing graffiti work, obviously an artwork across the city and elsewhere now. Um, and that in a way is bringing the community to artwork in a sense, which is a smart thing as well. Um, so I thank Carl obviously for that. I thank you all for being with us today. I hope you stick around. We've got 12 hours of content. It's a little bit like comic relief, but probably less funny and <laughs> a little bit more around the content around startups, technology and, and such. Um, but I thank you all for your time today. Um, we will see you soon and obviously keep smart. Thank you. Bye. Right guys. Um, as they all drop off, I'm just going to quickly mention that obviously every every two hours we have startups pitching here at digital. Uh, sorry, I was going to say digital DNA. Uh, level up. Wrong event. Um, wrong event. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so we've got twelve early stage NI startups pitching for Level Up. It's a a pitch competition um, in collaboration with their Instagram Enterprise Week. Um, Thankfully, we've got real-time recruitment on board as a co-sponsor for that as well. And there's a 2K cash prize awarded to the winning NI startup. Um, who's the judges, Fran, on this one? Great panel of judges, Alistair. We have uh, Beth Glenfield. She is a scout for Aid Adventures. Audrey Osborne is an investor at Techstart Ventures. We have Nico Albanese, who is a senior associate at Ascension Ventures. 
We have local star angel investor, Mary McKenna. We have Dave Graham. He is a technologist at Dell Technologies and PhD candidate at UCB's Smart Lab. And last but definitely not least is Naomi Timperley, who is the co-founder of Tech North Advocates. Just before we jump on, and we're going to go to Handy Caddy and Graham as the first pitching start off. I should give a shout out to Dave, uh, Mary, Naomi. Um, I'm probably missing someone, but we pulled them back from Lineup, which was a Dairy Enterprise Week event that happened last year. We're all virtual this year, understandably, but they were in, in Derry last year and it happens, I'm going to say about two or three days before we went on to lockdown. So we were blessed to have them with us. It's great that they're back this year supporting what we're doing. Um, who's up first again? So we have Handy Caddy and Graham Curry. So good luck, Graham. So next up in pitching, we have Graham Curry, the founder of Handy Caddy. Handy Caddy is developing an app which helps golf clubs and caddies digitize the process of scheduling caddy jobs. They're trialing the app with some of Ireland's highest ranked clubs this summer, and they're going to outline how they're going to do it for us right now. Over to you, Graham. No problem. You've introduced me very well, Colin. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Graham. I'm the founder of Handy Caddy. Um, so our app is essentially digitizing the process of how golf clubs and caddies communicate and schedule their jobs. So every day, thousands of golf clubs across the world schedule caddies. Now, caddies can provide incredible value to a golf tourist experience through providing their expertise to the golfers to better their scores. However, in arranging caddies, this first of all has to happen. Huge amounts of administrative work through spreadsheets and phone calls which is costing golf clubs thousands of pounds of opportunity costs every month to give back to their members. But what if these pain points could be removed? Well, in actual fact, they can. Handy Caddy is an app which allows golf clubs to schedule caddies at the click of a button. And, and also uh, caddies can set their schedule in advance and accept jobs. And golf clubs can see uh, reviews of caddies that have uh, previously performed um, in order to track how their workforce is performing. Uh, we have interest from three prestigious clubs across Ireland, um, including our Glass, Royal Dublin and La Hinch. And in a soft launch of our MVP, we've had 30 signups. We're also developing a growing community of caddies um, in which we're posting pretty much every day. Um, and we've also uh, got caddies in this community jobs um, with golf clubs in America and Scotland. Initial market we're entering is the golf tourism segment of Cadim, which has an initial TAM of 234 million. However, I think it gets exciting whenever we can create profiles of caddies on one side of the market and then eventually golfers. And this provides some uh, good matchmaking potential to expand this market further. Uh, we've received interest from some of the world's highest ranked clubs, including St Andrews, which is the biggest caddy set up in Europe as well as Pebble Beach, which is around 80,000 caddy rounds per year. Um, the market is set to boom in 2022. So a lot of tour operators bookings from this year has been transferred to next. Um, and the golf tourism industry is set to grow by 5.4 billion within the next four years. So all our competitors are currently focused on the golf country club market in America. So this is where golfers are booking the same caddies round on round. Where we differentiate is we're focusing on the golf tourism segment of caddying. Now, what I mean by that is if you're a golfer traveling from America to Ireland, you're going to have no idea in the quality of caddies that are there. So we want to create features for tour operators and for golfers to give them more information on their caddies quality and also previous ratings to make sure they're making an informed decision and create a better experience for everyone in the industry. Uh, so our team is heavily embedded in the caddying industry already. Uh, myself and Jamie caddy at Castle Rock Golf Club and have been doing so for the last five or six Especially years. Sessions. Um, also, Ryan has experience in developing uh, golf apps. We're going to be revenue generating this year. Um, we've already assumed partnerships with tour operators and we're targeting a partnership with Golf Now, which is the biggest booker of tee times in the world. Um, but our vision is to create a matching platform which allows golf tourists to choose their ideal caddy for the round of golf and bring our industry into a new era of connectivity and convenience. Thank you very much. Excellent, Graham. Thank you very much. If you just stop your screen share, I'll hand us over to the judges for questions. Naomi.
rookie mistake. I've been doing this for 12 months. Um, great pitch, Graham. Um, just wanted to just really quickly ask you about the um, the, the business model, uh, the financial model around it. So, yeah. you know, who, how, how do you make money from it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so initially we're trialing our MVP. So our focus is going to be on golf clubs and caddies. So the way we make money is we charge the golf club per booking. So golf clubs on average um, would have around 800 caddy rounds per month. So we would charge two pounds per booking. So in one golf club, we'd be making around 1600 pounds per month. And we're trialing it with five golf clubs. Thank you. Any other judge questions? Hey, Grant. Yes. Oh, sorry. You Mary, do you want to go? I, do you want to go? Mary. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, good to see you, uh, Graham. Um, that I understand that bit that you've just answered there for Naomi, but you did say that you're focusing on the golf tourism market. So yeah. wouldn't you be selling to the tour operators? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, you know, that's past the MVP stage. So we're looking to try out with golf clubs in Ireland this year, and then we're okay. building features in winter time. So, you know, tour operators are going to be our, and golfers are going to be our major clients going forward. You know, that's where the money really is at. So even if we assumed a similar model to Uber and took a 10% commission and caddies booked from golfers, you know, there's around 9 million golfers that are booking caddies every year. So yeah. if, if we could capture, you know, 10% of that market, there's there's some serious revenue to be made. You if know. I could tell you how many people have told me if they could capture 10% of X market, uh, yeah. we'd all be, you know, I mean, the B2B, I understand completely. The B2C, have you calculated how much money you would need to raise in order to do the marketing for that? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely something uh, to be had with, actually connecting with tour operators so around 70 percent of golfers would book through the tour operators yeah. so provided we got partnerships with the biggest tour operators i mean the likes of car golf in ireland if we could partner with them that would give us access to forty thousand. so establishing them key big golf tour or golf tour operator partnerships yeah. would give are us you access. talking to those guys already graham yeah, we, we have interest yeah. from three of the biggest in Ireland at the minute. Um, and, and yeah, looking to further my connections with that. Um, okay. But we're trying to provide as much value as we can within our community at the minute. So, you know, when we actually ask to, to partner, when we have the solution made, then it's it's a bit more feasible. Okay, thank you. Last question. Excellent. Nico, last question to you. Great. Thanks, Graham. Uh, well done with the pitch. Um, I'd love if you could touch a bit on the distribution model because obviously like you're building up or the intention is really bottom up building a strong community with the caddies, but yeah. you're, you're selling into the club. So what, what's kind of, what's the approach on your end for, I guess, for, for, for monetizing that, that group of caddies, or at least having them push, um, push the business to the clubs and, and, and get that over the line. Yeah, absolutely. So it really interests in what's happening in the community already. So we have caddy masters and caddies. So caddies are actually getting jobs from caddy masters that are in the community. So I had one guy hired, he's from the UK, but he got hired in New York. So it can nearly be an employment tool as well for caddy masters to hire. So in order for caddies to be part of this long term, they could possibly pay a subscription fee. So there's definite monetization potential in that. But and um, to go back to Mary's point, I think the the massive potential is on the golfer's side, you know, very high net worth clients um the golfers will come across here so um i think you know that's where we're going to make our biggest revenue long term excellent brilliant thank you very much graham well done thank you so much to graham and our judges for all of the questions uh, graham has been on the startup scene now for a few years and um, his resilience and his persistence is absolutely incredible. Um, so thank you, Graham, for your pitch. Next up, we have Rachel Coulter with Stable Manager. So best of luck, Rachel, and well done, Graham, again. So next up, we have Rachel Coulter, founder of Stable Manager. So Rachel is the founder and the CEO of Stable Manager, the equestrian world's new hub. Quality performance, uh, simplifying horse care and streamlining your equine business is now a possibility with their purpose-built mobile app, which is built uh, by an equestrian for other equestrians. So Rachel, it's over to you. Thank you. 
This is Totalus. He was bought for 15 million euro. Imagine if someone gave him the wrong feed. In horses, this causes gastrointestinal issues, colic, and can even lead to death. At Stable Manager, we are eradicating this problem. As an award-winning software engineer and a Grand Prix level dressage rider, I built Stable Manager for any yard of any size anywhere in the world. And it's part of an equestrian market valued at 300 billion. We already have global early adopters from Europe and the USA. We're not only saving stable yards upwards of 25,000 per year, we are saving horses' lives. Stable manager is not just a part of the future of the equestrian industry, we are creating that future. Stable manager is a first of its kind iOS, Android and web app built from the ground up by an equestrian for equestrians and delivers individualized care routines for every horse, no matter how many you're trying to juggle. Stable Manager connects equine businesses directly with their customers anywhere in the world to make both local and global sales and helps you manage your team through a purpose-built task management interface. Stable Manager is the equestrian world's new hub. I've been involved with horses for over 16 years now and compete at Grand Prix. This is the highest level of dressage seen at the Olympics, and I'm one of two riders from Northern Ireland who compete at this level. I've worked on multiple yards from a local riding school to an international dressage yard with horses worth millions, as well as being a coach myself. This allows me to have great founder market fit. I'm also a software engineer specializing in the fields of AI and app development. I've won, mo I've won multiple hackathons, most recently the woman who code hack for her, I'm a member of the Propel Pre Accelerator, Impacting Founders, and I'm a Young Digital Woman of the Year finalist. In terms of market valuation, the global equestrian market is worth over 300 billion worldwide. I've already received applications from over 50 early access users, including a training center that teaches TV and film stars to ride, a veterinary physio who operates across the North and South of Ireland, and a specialist riding coach from Ohio in the USA. There are 9.2 million horse owners in the USA and 2 million in the UK. Stable Manager is an inherently global product and has a tiered monthly subscription model which suits everybody's needs, from single horse owners all the way up to large equine businesses, bringing cutting edge technology to the, to the equine sector. Applications are closing shortly for the early access program for Stable Manager ahead of its launch. So if you know an equine service provider or a horse owner yourself, the website is www.stablemanager.tech. Or if you think you could help accelerate what I'm doing with Stable Manager, I'm Rachel Calder on LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rachel. If you can just stop your screen share and we can open the floor to the judges for questions. Who wants to go first? Bet. Away you go. Hey Rachel. Um, nice to see you, obviously. Um, so yeah, like just wanted to say you sort of focused on two key areas there, which is connecting equine suppliers with their customer as well as obviously horse health. So what's the focus going to be sort of going into this? Because they're very different markets, obviously. So the way Stable Manager works, it's basically network effect where service providers who want to offer their services on the platform bring their clients and then vice versa, where those clients come on and then they refer to their other service providers. So we're actually doing like an all encompassing approach to allow for that sort of two way street. So do the service providers pay a subscription as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. There's a free tier for um, people who just want the book in with them if they don't want any of the horse care functionality, which means they don't lose some of their existing customers. Mary. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, have you built technology yourself? Yeah, so I'm a I'm sole founder. Um, so I've built Stable Manager. I've had bits of help with bits and pieces of like we bits of front end and stuff like that just to kind of speed up the process. But yeah, I'm the software engineer. And when you 
roll your products out and it starts to sell and it starts to scale. How big do you think your team will be and what sorts of people will be in the team? So I'm, as well as obviously software engineers to develop product, I'm a real like support person. I really value the importance of having the support. So I'd be building out those two teams as well as obviously market and sales, et cetera. But I really see Stable Manager as being like the de facto equi management solution worldwide and building a team to facilitate such. And from the map that you showed us, other parts of the globe have much higher spends than the UK does. So is it a company that you would move to the Middle East or to Australia or to the States or something like that? Is that the long term plan? Is that your plan? So I think like what's brilliant about especially this digital age is at the moment I can access those sort of markets from where I am in Northern Ireland. But definitely um, in the US, especially, I'd be definitely thinking of opening an office there. Um, I wouldn't say moving the company there. I always think we'll be, you know, in our <laughs> Northern Irish roots. But um, yeah, I facilitate or I envision seeing offices popping up across the globe. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then, Good luck. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm able to sort of access developers and stuff who work remotely and stuff like that. But yeah, that's the long term plan. <laughs> Last question then to Audrey. Rachel, so so as you move this product out globally, does the care for the horses and the type of feed and, and, and the different aspects, does, does that change? And does that mean you have to have different versions of your apps available for the, for the different locations? So the way the app works is um, there are sort of suggested routines in there, which will be backed by pro primarily the British federations. However, you're able to set each horse's routine yourself. So if you've got a horse that requires metal shoes, he'll need to be seen every eight weeks. One that needs a barefoot trim might be every 10. So we really allow horse owners to set their own routines and their own needs for their horses because they know them best. And from the business point of view as well, um, the service providers, I'm like, I'm here to support your business and how you want to run it. So it's really customizable that way. So we won't need different versions. They'll just be like language settings and stuff like that. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rachel. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> We're back in the room. Big smiley faces for me now. Uh, this is the end of the first session nearly. I just wanted to say thank you to Esri Island again. Fran? much better co-host than I am, to be fair as well. <laughs> Friends with us for the whole day. Um, just wanted to say Rachel, who was just pitching there, she was part of Impacting Founders, which is a female founder program that we ran. Um, obviously, I'm not part of the judging process. Thank goodness, because I couldn't make a decision on all the startups, to be honest. But what That's I would say is Ulster Bank funded uh, Young Enterprise in collaboration with us. It, how important is it that you have the corporate level support like Esri, like Ulster Bank, um, that support obviously the early stage tech sector in Northern Ireland. Yeah, well, I mean, they make all the programs possible, you know, without the support from them, then so many of the, the programs and the accelerators and the different support networks available to young entrepreneurs just wouldn't exist. Yeah. Um, especially in terms of networking and advice and the value that these corporates provide on another level, as well as just financial, is really incredible. And we're so lucky to have that support yeah. network here in Northern Ireland. Absolutely. And it's obviously, uh, you know, testament to obviously that they, they want to do work everywhere. It's not just like it's Belfast centric. Uh, Ulster Bank support in Derry and Straban, obviously, with the Impacting Founders Programme. Um, we just want to see more people coming through, don't we? And I think that's evident with these two startups. Graham's from the North Coast. Rachel, she's not from Belfast. I can't remember for the life of me where she is, but there's talent all over the, the, the Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland, to be fair. Um, so thank you for listening to the first session. Um, smart cities, smart places, rural innovation. I think obviously we could have probably chatted for about three or four more hours. Um, we're just going to end with uh, some music and I just wanted to touch on this. We've asked bands in the Derry Straban area to submit their videos. The point to this is, is that we want to encourage obviously that music scene, which is to be honest, had nothing obviously to kind of support it in the last 12 months, apart from obviously small grants and handouts. And we feel obviously for that sector, as we do obviously the, the, the entertainment sector full stop, obviously in terms of the actual performance side. Um, so first up is Amber Light with Peace At Last. I've been down, I've 
I've been broken So many words unspoken Felt alone but I am strong Something tells me that I belong So I will take now All I need to Head is wide and open. The fire inside has been woken. I'm thinking forward, not looking back. Feels like I'm moving on the right track. So I will take now all I need to know. Summer's past Will I find my peace?